Welcome everyone, it's Jeff Duddy. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some wiener management strategies and then economics and marketing of the lambs. Um, we're going to go through a few of our lamb categories, our weight categories, uh, and look at the pros and cons of the various systems. So first up today, we're going to look at trying to focus on efficiencies, particularly when it comes to weaning time. Uh, just a few points, approximately 60% of the total feed requirements are required for ewe maintenance. So two thirds of uh, total feed needed across the year is needed just to maintain that ewe. Weaning actually reduces your overall DSC or dry sheep equivalent rating and feed requirements by about 30%. So if you find that the season turns against you and you haven't got a lot of feed at hand, uh, weaning may well be one of your better options. One third of ewes are responsible for about two thirds of lamb losses, so it's important and weaning is a good time to do it. Um, lamb marking as well if you have time and the labour on hand to do it, but uh, to actually check the ewes udders and look at culling those ewes that are habitually losing lambs. Um, many occasions it may not be the ewe's fault per se, it may be a blind teat from shearing cuts or something like that, but um, we do find that a small proportion of your total ewes actually really do make up a big proportion of your total um, lamb losses. And the other bit is 80% of weaner mortalities occur in the bottom 20% on, on a weight basis. So the heavier you can get those lambs prior to and at the point of weaning, the better that it'll, it'll be in terms of um, lamb survival, uh, weaner survival post weaning. Okay, just preparing your lambs for weaning. Most people would have seen this sort of graph before. We're looking on the, uh, the bottom axis, the weeks after lambing, and on the left hand axis, your uh, milk production and grass or pasture intake by lambs. Your milk production peaks around three to four weeks after lambing. Um, this is the time when the ewe has her greatest feed requirements, energy requirements. Um, under poor past conditions, which thankfully not many people are facing at the moment, but you'll find your lambs, particularly twin born lambs, will begin to graze a little bit earlier than normal. By about eight weeks of age, the lambs are starting to consume more pasture than milk as a percentage of their total intake. So they're actually actively competing against the ewe, um, particularly from eight weeks on. And by 12 weeks of age, effectively, uh, all the lamb's doing is, is keeping that ewe in milk production mode. So she has to continually use her body reserves to uh, produce milk, even though the lambs aren't getting much milk out of the milk that they're actually consuming a day. They're getting more out of the pasture or supplements that we're feeding them. So what do we do prior to weaning to prepare lambs for weaning? Our optimum uh, weaning age is around 12 weeks of age, which for a standard six week join or six week lambing period is 14 weeks after the first lamb is born. We like to look at minimum live weight targets. I like to see at least a minimum of 15 kilos for merino lambs. Um, and 18 kilos for crossbred lambs. That can be difficult in some seasons, for sure. On an industry basis, recommendation is to have lambs reach around 45% of the ewe's standard reference weight or her mature weight. So to give you a bit of an idea, if your ewe um, flock is around 50 kilograms, um, the target would be about 23 kilograms for that lamb or those lambs um, at weaning, uh, for a 60 kilogram ewe, we target somewhere around 27 kilograms at weaning. Now that can be hard to achieve, um, even in crossbreed lamb flocks, but um, they're the targets that we, we set and hopefully uh, we can look to um, reach those because they really do have a big impact when it comes to lamb and weaner survival. The main thing, and this is shown out of some great work that um, Sue Hatcher and a few others have actually done in the southern and central tablelands with monitoring some lamb groups. Um, you only need to get lambs or have lambs putting on around 50 plus grams a day post weaning 
and that makes a huge difference when it comes to uh, weaner survival. That small increase in growth rates can dramatically improve survival. Faster growing and heavier wean weaners accumulate more body reserves. Um, they're given a better start in life, and if it's a self-replacing flock, uh, you'll find that those heavier lambs, heavier at weaning, tend to be also heavier um, when it comes to reaching mature weights and, and joining. This is some of the uh, work that Sue Hatcher and, and, and cohorts actually uh, found. If you look at um, the four sort of sections here, and this is the lightest 25% of lambs across 15 flocks they were monitoring in the southern and central tablelands. And they basically found the lightest 25% of lambs were nearly twice as likely to die post weaning. If we look at, and this on this graph, we use this a lot uh, in lifetime, you breadwell, bedwell programs and the like, but I've based this on a 55 kilogram standard reference weight or U mature weight. So remember our target was 45% of that mature weight. So that's around about 25 kilos target for the lambs at weaning. If, however, those lambs are only 15 kilos, but you're able to put them on reasonable feed, whether it's a pasture base or supplementary feed, and they're maintaining or increasing growth rate post weaning, you'll find that we move up this um, weaner survival curve and you'll get similar sort of survival rates to lambs that have uh, reached the, uh, the recommended weaning weight. Stressful time at weaning. Um, for every day of weight loss during weaning, it takes three days to put it back on. So we need to try and minimise weaning, uh, sorry, stress at weaning time. Um, quite confident control of, of the uh, lambs and the like up to and prior to weaning is going to help. Um, just a few potential um, management uh, practices you can um, consider implementing that may help with reducing that weaning stress. Um, you may look at returning the lambs to their lambing paddock. Um, normally we wouldn't recommend you do this because of potential worm burdens in those paddocks, but the lambs know those paddocks. They know the grazing patterns or the grazing areas. They know the watering points. They know the general layout of those paddocks. So that will go a fair way to reducing stress um, post weaning. You may look at split weaning where you'll go in and wean once, twice, maybe three times, um, where you'll go in the first time and wean those heavier lambs um, and then maybe leave lighter lambs on their mums or the dams for another week or two before you then look at weaning uh, those lambs. You may look at cross weaning and some producers do implement this strategy where lambs aren't with their actual mums, but they have adult ewes or weathers um, with them post weaning. So having those mature animals there tends to reduce the stress load on the ewes, sorry, on the lambs. Um, also helps out particularly if uh, moving to a clean or fresh paddock the lambs aren't used to. Those mature animals will help with um, taking the lambs or, or showing them where watering points and the like are. You may look at running 5% adult sheep. Again, it may be um, weathers <clears throat> with your weaned lambs. This will help to reduce the stress levels on those lambs. Um, and something we don't do a lot of, uh, particularly um, in line of, if we compare it to the beef industry, where they do a lot of yard weaning. It may be as short as three to five days where we've actually got them in an enclosed area, basically a confinement area, um, getting them used to different uh, equipment and noises and sounds and dogs and and um, and vehicles, um, that will go a long way to help reducing stress as well. There's a couple of options you can use. Um, I love this creep feeding or creep gate principle. Um, basically, 10 to 12 inch gaps um, between the posts um, or the the bars in a in a um, creep gate. And you can put a horizontal bar about 18 inches off the ground to prevent any skinny ewes or ewes off shears from actually squeezing through that 10 to 12 inch gap. Um, that goes a long way to providing lambs access to either supplementary feed that you might provide in the paddock prior to weaning. 
Um, or even if, if, say, across a gateway that goes into a uh, winter cereal um, paddock, which is not quite ready for the entire mob to go on to, but we can give the lambs access, say, to, to that winter cereal, or maybe some loosen or, or a forage crop or something that, again, you don't want to put the whole mob on. Creek feeding can help increase lamb energy and protein intakes, improving their growth rates. It reduces demand on pasture and the ewe, and it reduces its cost because we're not feeding the ewe any expensive feeds. So we're actually focusing on pushing the lambs pre-weaning. Imprinting, and most people would do this part, and I'd, I'd really recommend people do it even in good years. Um, because sheep are, are neophobic, they're scared of new things, they need to learn, um, and the way they basically do that, or lambs do that, is, is from mum. There are big benefits with pre-training lambs, um, prior to weaning, while they're still with mum, um, a lifetime recognition and increased acceptance of things like feed types, so a grain, whether it's a cereal grain or a pulse, um, even hays, um, feeding equipment, troughs, um, self-feeders, even water troughs, um, there are big benefits with actually having those lambs learn about those things while they're with mum. <coughs> Excuse me. I would really recommend people do this part, of course, even in a good year where we look at pre-feeding uh, or introducing lambs to grains or different feed types and the like, um, up to about two weeks prior to weaning. And it doesn't take much. Um, we don't need to have a full supplementary feed uh, for them, but uh, we just need enough to drag the ewe to the feed trail, um, or if you're using self-feeders, something to drag the ewes in there. Um, it may be as much, uh, as little as three or four feeds over a 10 to 14 day period, um, around about 50 grams a ewe, uh, just to drag that ewe into that feed trail. Um, the lambs will come along and they'll end up looking and finding out what this feed's all about. What you need to target, however, is to have at least 90% of those lambs actively feeding. Um, if you find after two weeks uh, they're not quite at that stage, you might need to continue for another couple of days. Okay, economics and markets. Now, we all know that the lamb job is going gangbusters. I'm going to break this down into a couple of different categories. We've got our trade and export or heavy lambs, as they're generally called now. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the merino side as well, and also the store lamb job, which is the real gangbuster of the whole thing. I mean, there is such an interest in buying store lambs and finishing them. Um, it really is an area I think most people should target when it comes to their, their marketing or um, sale, ca uh, sale um, category. Okay, we'll talk about trades first up. We're looking here from 2007 up to current day. Um, I just wanted to show you the impact of the Aussie dollar in slaughter and the like. If you look there at the yellow, our yellow um, line, that's the Aussie dollar where it's been sitting. Back in 2011, you remember we had record prices back then um, and we were in a flock rebuild stage. So the slaughter numbers were actually right down. So. That actually helped with the, uh, the high demand and, and $6.50 we were getting back then, which is crazy when we think about the sort of money we make now. But And it was interesting back then that the um, Aussie dollar was, you know, over parity, uh, but the demand was there. Our export demand, and we're probably sitting around 65% of our product is exported. Um, the export demand has really just continued to grow. Slaughter numbers have uh, improved, and in the last couple of years, we've seen numbers sort of drop off um, as we're in yet another drought. Um, and luckily, the Aussie dollar had been down as well, even during uh, the middle of COVID last year when we got down to sort of 55 cents. And that was uh, certainly helping when it come to export um, demand, and we didn't really see much of a correction in the, uh, in the land prices at all during the peak of COVID last year. The um, estimates for the coming year is that we're going to see our slaughter numbers improve slightly up to somewhere around 21 million. Um, but the Aussie dollar is on the way up. So what impact that's going to have will be interesting to look at. 
personally, I feel that uh, given that uh, there is such a demand for our product overseas, we really aren't going to see too much of a price correction at all. If we look at this graph, this is going back to 2012, so the last 10 years. Um, and this is on a calendar year base. So week one is January, the first week in January, week 52, um, the last week of the year. This 100%, that is the average price across that year. Okay, I just want to show you how prices have changed. Um, and, and that's the sort of pattern we are now in at the moment um, over 10 years. And it's flattened out a lot. This curve has flattened out a lot. We used to have a more of a peak around that uh, July, August period where we have that 10% sort of premium happening at the moment compared to the average or where the red line is. Um, and we certainly had more of a trough in the spring months. Um, now it's only going down to about 5% less um, on a cents per kilo base for, um, for lambs sold during that time of year. So we've flattened out the curve a lot. Now, one of the reasons for that is that we've actually seen a change in lambing times to a later time, um, particularly in southern New South Wales, where traditionally it would sort of be an autumn type lambing. Now we're looking more into winter lambing. So lambs are being carried over for more for a longer period. Um, and that is one main reason. The other one would be that um, we are now seeing uh, contracts put out well in advance to compare to where they used to be. So it's put a lot of surety into the land market. Just quickly to run you through, this is that light blue line is the um, average price across the year for 2012. You notice then again, we were coming out of 2011 where we had record land prices, so we had high prices. And then we got back to some sort of normalcy. Um, 2013 pattern, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18 was a little bit out of the ordinary where we actually had prices early in the year a lot lower than we normally would. And then we really had a peak um, sort of around about that September period and into the spring. Um, so a little bit out of the ordinary. 2019, similar sort of pattern to the long term averages. Um, 2020, yeah, still a fair bit of noise around um, that average line and what we've seen so far this year. So if you look at it on a year and year basis, you can actually say, it's, well, how do you pick when to sell? But by doing this average price, this dark blue line there on the screen, um, we have some idea, okay, when is the best time to sell? Um, and if we look at that price, there again is the average across the period for the last 10 years. We have that 10% premium sort of still in that July, August period, about a 5% drop off in the spring, 5 to 10% in the sort of um, early summer months. If we look at 2020 and 2021 to date, the average trade land price was $8.25. That equates to a range of between $171 up to $209 for a 23 kilo carcass, depending on when you sold it. And that come back to a range of about $38 between the, uh, the peak when you would be selling at the top dollar versus say the trough, which is been around here in that early sort of summer months. Or that also equates to the, it's equivalent to about $1.65 a kilo. Okay, so, so it is important to try and look at when you um, turn lambs off. It still remains that at early sucker or spring, early spring lamb um, tends to bring the premium, uh, but it really depends on the cost of, uh, what it's cost you to get that lamb to market. If it's coming off grass, it's uh, always cheaper than if you have to do some heavy supplementary feeding or feedlotting. We just now look at um, compare trade and export categories. Um, you'll see those in the highlighted in the yellow in those boxes. And if you look at the difference between the average for 2020 for trade and export lambs and 2021, you'll see that the export lambs actually are falling a fair way behind. And I've been pretty vocal, I guess, over the last 10, 15 years that the industry is pushing for producers to get heavier and heavier. It's least efficient, it's less efficient because they the lambs are eating more feed, they're putting on fat, um, and you aren't getting penalised for that fat, luckily, but the processes are actually, it's costing them a lot of money to trim off that fat. 
So I would always recommend that you look at targeting a heavy trade weight, uh, 23 to 24 kilos. Get them off the farm. Um, if the season's against you or if the prices are there for store lambs, I'd be moving them earlier than a trade lamb weight. Uh, and we'll discuss that in a minute. But if you look here back to 2004 um, on this graph, um, we have here anything above this x-axis is when export weights were making more per kilo than trade lambs, and anything below is when they were making less per kilo. And if we look at from 2012, so about the centre of this graph on, export lambs made on average about $0.05 cents a kilo less than trade lambs, um, and they made it about 49% of the time. So uh, there was probably no... If you're looking right back to 2012, you'd probably say, well, OK, you might as well just take them to export weights if you have the feed on farm. If, though, if we look what's happening in the last couple of years, since 2019, exports have been 14 cents a kilo less than trade lambs, um, and the trade lambs have made more than the export lambs for 77% of the time. And if we look from 2000, uh, 2020 and this year, we're now looking at a 24 cents per kilo difference between our trade lamb and export lamb. Um, so I would really, depending on what happens in the next six months in particular, I would be looking at turning lambs off at, at a good trade weight. Don't take them through to export weights. Um, it's false economics, it really is. Get those lambs off farm, give the food to mum so she can get in better condition um, and therefore give you more lambs at the next joining. If we now look at our merino job, for those who are looking at a self-replacing uh, or wool enterprise, and this is where it's really interesting too. This is merino lamb relative to trade lamb carcass values. And they've pretty well been flatlining over the last four to five years. Um, and the merino carcass has averaged around about 92% of the value of what crossbred lamb carcasses, trade lamb carcasses are making. Okay, so... They've really sort of got to come up into their own, and that's a function of things like we are now producing a, a deal, a true, a true dual-purpose merino that is more focused on on carcass traits, um, not just the wool side. But processors also know that um, the meat yields from merinos can be as high as crossbred lands, particularly if they don't have to trim the fat. So we're looking at the last four to five years, around about. Um, you know, flatlining there around about 92% of the value of trade lambs. If we look at that same data, and this is the cents per kilo difference, and we've had a bit of a jump up in the last year or so, um, and we've had export, sorry, we've had our prices right up there around 850 up to 1,000 a thousand cents. <clears throat> but they've averaged somewhere around about 61 cents per kilo less than that um, crossbred lambs. And that comes back to about 13 bucks 40 less per 22 kilo carcass. What though of the skin and wool values? This is where the merino comes into its own. And just if we look quickly at what's happening with skin values, and anyone who, who's who been selling lambs will know that um, crossbreed lamb skins and, and um, new season skins are really nowhere near what they used to be. If we look back in 2012 or so, um, our sucker lamb skins, and crossbred lamb skins, we're bringing ten to twelve dollars. We are now looking around about two to three dollars per skin. The market and ninety-five percent or so of our lamb skins were sent overseas, mainly to China. Uh, there's been a big closure over there over time um, in the processing plants, and demand for the skins have really fallen away. If, however, we look at this dotted line here, is inch and a half to two inch merino lamb skins or a two and a half to three inch skin, we are looking upwards of 15 to 20 dollars for those skins. Now remember I said the difference um, was about 13 dollars 42 between a trade weight um, lamb, crossbred lamb and a merino carcass. So how do we pick that up with the lamb skin? We'll just show you with this. Um, the dotted brown line here is a two inch, the difference between a two inch merino skin and a crossbred lamb skin. So if you look in the dotted dotted blue line is um, a, a sucker lamb skin. So we're looking upwards of around about $8 difference here between a merino and a crossbred lamb skin. Um, a two inch, if we look at three inch, 
we're looking well and truly up around you know, 15 to $20 difference here. So if we look at the two inch ones, that's around about a 41 cents per kilo if we bring it back on a carcass weight basis or a carcass value. And that's about a $9 extra for a merino skin. If we look at a three inch merino versus a crossbred um, uh, lamb skin, at 72 cents or the equivalent of 72 cents per kilo on a carcass basis, which is 14, almost $15 more for the merino skin compared to the crossbred lamb skin. Then if we look at the difference between a three inch merino skin versus a sucker lamb skin, we're looking around about 17 or $18 difference. So that carcass value that the merino is behind um, compared to the crossbred lamb is well and truly picked up in the skin value. So the merinos really are holding their own. Okay, the last one is our store lambs. As I said before, they're the gangbuster. They're the ones that have been doing so well over the last five years in particular. And I think it's principally because, not just because um, we've had supply down uh, due to drought, but um, because of the strength in the lamb industry as a whole, um, and particularly our export markets and how they've been able to weather, weather all the storms. Uh, it's just such an interest in, in finishing lambs, and it really has artificially pushed the price of these store lambs sky high. Okay, and if we just look at the last two years, 2020 and 2021, store lamb prices here, and we're pushing on average around about $9.50, $9.60. Um, compared to the trade and the heavy or export type lambs, and if we just look at the trade values, we're looking in the last two years, you know, over a dollar twenty, or around about a dollar twenty cents per kilo more for trade for store lambs than the trade lambs. So you're getting paid a hell of a lot of money for an unfinished lamb. That's a good thing, because it has been really tough um, during the drought, in particular when grain prices go sky high, to actually make a decent margin if feedlotting. And these high store lamb values are the main issue or the main impact um, on profit margin um, and has made it pretty risky in recent years to actually look at feedlotting. To my mind, store lamb values need to be 85% relative to trade lambs, and I'll explain this relative to relativity in a second, uh, if you're going to finish the lambs in feedlots. If they're being finished on pasture, um, you've got a bit more of a margin there. So if they're trading around 95% of the value of our trade lambs when we sell those lambs, um, then you've got a reasonable chance of you know, minimising risk and providing uh, reasonable profit margins. And I call, call this a relativity, all right? A store lamb relativity or relative to the trade lamb. And how I work that out is we've got this store lamb relativity, we've got our store lamb um, values here, okay, they were looking, and these are actual values uh, from the um, NLRS. So back in on the 7th of May, the average for a store lamb in eastern states was 917 cents. I then look at what that lamb is uh, was sold for in six weeks' time. So we put him on farm or got him on farm, got him in a feedlot and finished him to a, uh, a trade weight in six weeks' time. And in that period, and we were selling these lambs in the middle of June, they were making $8.41. So this relativity is the store lamb value divided by what we can sell that lamb for. All right. And that come back, those actually come back at 1.09 or 109%. That is the relativity that I'm talking about, the, the term that I use. So relative to the trade lambs, when we sell those lambs, the store lambs were 109%. Okay. This is a graph showing back to 2012, this relativity. All right, so where these store lambs sit relative to the trade lambs when we sell them. This point at 100% here is when they're worth the same um, on a cents per kilo base. This 95%, as I mentioned earlier, is the point I believe which the lambs need to be below that um, to actually give you a reasonable chance of making a good profit on pasture. And this 85% is is the point that we need that relativity to be below for those um, lambs going into a feedlot. So you can see this, this line, this red line, this relativity here is well and truly above 
the point which I believe we need to be at if you want to be assured of making some reasonable uh, margins in your feed load. So how do we work it out? Uh, as I went, showed you before, um, we want to do it uh, at a point six weeks after the store lambs value. So we haven't got a crystal bore, unfortunately, but we do have contract prices, which can help um, with this whole process. But OK, I'll just walk you through it. We've got store lambs, 17 kilo carcass weight, $128 on farm. We sell them at 23 kilos uh, carcass weight for 196 bucks. That's a gross value. We don't divide the store lamb value by the trade lamb value. That would give us a relativity, if you like, of 65%. It's not that at all. We need to divide the store lamb's value on a cents per kilo base by the cents per kilo base of that trade lamb. We do that and we get that relativity of around, in this um, example, of 88%. So don't do it on a dollars per head base. Work it out on a cents per kilo base. Okay, almost there. The feedlot calculator, it's no longer available online. It was a sheep CRC feedlot calculator that we developed um, when I was in New South Wales DPI. Um, I'm more than happy to actually uh, send a copy out to people. Um, or Sue should be able to have it uh, available as well. Uh, and this is how we use or what we use to work out the likely profit margins, not just from feedlots, but you can also use it for pasture-based finishing, which I've done in this occasion. So I've looked at a couple of scenarios, um, grazing versus feedlot economics um, going forward for anyone who's um, looking to make decisions on what to do with their lambs post-weaning. We're looking at 800 homebred lambs, 35 kilo store lambs. I'm gonna say they're worth 150 on farm, which is pretty close to what they're doing at the moment. We're looking lot fed, lot fed versus pasture or any forage based um, feed. When we're feed, lot feeding, we're looking at a barley lupins mix. Percent um, pasture hay as part of it as well. We're looking at reasonable to good growth rates and it's gonna be about 50 days on feed. So let's say two months all up. Our foragers have actually gone and said that they're a little bit later, uh, if you like, in the season than, than uh, what we've got at the moment um, and therefore have a higher dry amount of percentage. Um, and part of the diet is going to be 20% pasture hay to keep that fibre levels up, and we have a slightly lower lamb growth rate, a little bit more time on feed for them to um, reach our target weights. We sell them at eight bucks fifty a kilo, plus a two dollar skin, so we come back to about one hundred ninety nine dollars for that 20, uh, 23 kilo store lamb, uh, trade lamb. Okay. We've got a little bit of information there. I'm not going to go through all that. I've already mentioned a few things there, but generally I've worked on about 3.5% of the lamb's um, live weight is what they'll eat a day. Okay, so, and that's pretty well holds firm in a feedlot situation. Um, in a pasture-based situation, uh, it could be actually a fair bit higher than that, depending on, um, on the amount of moisture and the like in the feed and how quick that gut flow is. But what happened? So we looked at all the figures, put them all in uh, in a feedlot situation. Our ration cost was about $234 a tonne, which come back to about 12% of our total costs. Normally we sit around 20, 25% of our total costs uh, is, is due to feed, uh, all the feed costs. We look at our transport commission health treatments, they're about 9% of costs, which is in the ballpark of normal sort of costs. The expected profit margin for putting lambs in this feedlot for close to two weeks was $10.40 per lamb. All right, so that's starting at $150 as a store lamb, taking them through and selling them for $199. So you make $10.40 for that lamb. The break even price is $8.02. So if you can be pretty well assured, particularly if you take a contract up and it's more than $8 a kilo, you're pretty well assured if your ration costs in particular aren't much higher than that, that you're going to make about $10 a head profit. If we look at what's happened on pasture, it was about half the cost on a dry matter base because it's always going to be cheaper feeding them on pasture than, than in a feedlot. Um, so our feed costs were a little bit less again uh, of our total costs and our running costs were and um, transport commission, those sort of things were about 8%, about the same sort of costs. 
you make slightly more per head and you have a slightly lower break even price of eight dollars so there's money to be made for sure but um and these figures are all worked on the average values that are going i don't work on the extremes um to be honest is it worth your while to be making 10 to 15 say dollars a head profit over the next two months um, or so once you've weaned these lambs or should you actually um, sell those lambs now as a store lamb. You'll see these are the breakdown of costs for those two scenarios. And I mentioned the um, the feed costs were very much below what they normally are as a percentage of total costs. Normally in a feedlot situation in particular, we're looking around 20, 25% of our total costs are related to feed. So our impact of store lamb prices is actually a lot higher than what it normally is. It's normally around 65, 70% of total costs. So it's risky. And that's why I think you are better off, particularly if the season turns against you, to consider selling your lambs as store lambs. Right? Just to uh, really sum it up, that store lamb value continues to be the largest cost when we feed lambs, whether it's a, a grazing situation or in a feedlot situation. And when we consider that the average cost for producing a crossbred store lamb you know, taking it or getting it to about 38, 40 kilos live without much grain or additional cost going down its throat would probably cost you around 85 to 90 dollars to get it to that weight. Is it worth you taking the risk to take those lambs onto heavy weights or should you just sell them? Put them on the box, auctions plus. You don't need to sell them if you don't make a minimum price. <clears throat> so they cost you 85 to 90 dollars, but you can make 140, 150 dollars as a store lamb you will make more profit by selling that store lamb than trying to finish it in a feedlot under most occasions. And I love feedlotting. I love the principles of finishing your lamb, but you've just got to do your sums. Luckily, we've got tools like the Sheep CRC feedlot calculator, and we have contracts well and truly out in advance now, so you can budget on, you know, is it worth your while to take these lambs through or to buy lambs in and finish them on farm? So with that, I'll finish up there. Um, Sue, again, thank you for the opportunity to actually talk today. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if people want to contact me. There are my details um, on the screen. Um, and yeah, thanks and good luck. There we go. Ooh.